Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, February 5th, 2019. We have had a few technological issues today. I pressed start streaming about, oh, 20 minutes ago. It said I was streaming. It said I was streaming. I started doing the show. I was not streaming. I am so sorry that so many of you have been here waiting for the show to start while I was doing the show, having not actually started. But we seem to now have all the technology under control. And as always, I am here to put science in your brains. So uh, we have a variety of stories to bring you today. Nothing entirely exciting, but some observational opportunities. Coming soon, coming on February 19th at 519 Universal Time, we are going to have an occultation of the star Cirrus. For those of you that live in the Southern Hemisphere, this should be a familiar view um, where we have Orion um, on the far side of this image and then Canis Major, the large hunting dog of Orion the Hunter, following at the heels. Now, uh, for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, the perspective is a little bit different. So here we have Orion facing the other direction with his shield and club raised and Canis trotting behind. Um, <laughs> The lines don't actually appear on the sky, but sometimes the clouds do. Um, so Ceres is the brightest star in the sky for most folks most of the time. Uh, there are always exceptions, but right now, if you go out and look, if you don't have clouds like I do, and if it's nighttime, um, you should be able to see Ceres hanging bright and clear near Orion. Now, the thing is, that star is going to disappear um, for just a few moments on February 19th. Now, this isn't the kind of thing that everyone is going to be able to see. In fact, you need to be living along this path across the planet. This is the path uh, along which you will be able to see uh, the occultation occur. This is um, going to be what happens when asteroid 4388 Jürgenstock passes in front of Cirrus. Now, depending on where you live along the path, you're going to see different parts of the asteroid pass in front of the star. So if we pretend that this turtle is Cirrus and if we actually I'm going to use a much larger object to be serious. So if we pretend that this strange frog creature is serious and we use this dog as our asteroid, if you're because the asteroid is so much closer, it's able to completely if things line up perfectly it's able to completely block out Ceres. Now, as you can see, it's super hard to get this alignment. And depending on where you are, you're going to sometimes see just the, the one part of the asteroid pass in front of Ceres. Sometimes you'll see a different part of the asteroid pass in front of Ceres. And the duration at which you see Ceres disappear tells us how wide the asteroid is at that point along the sight line. So different observers all along this path are going to be able to see different parts of the asteroid block out Cirrus. Now, I know what matters to most of you, because this is where humans live, where is that path across land? Well, here is the path, and can I recommend, and this is why I'm bringing it up with so much lead time. If you're looking for a random winter getaway, if you want to take off on a road trip across the United States, Canada, or Mexico, well, here's the place to go. 
And here's a place to be on February 19th. In the middle of the night, times may vary depending on your time zone. As I said, this will be occurring at 519 Universal Time. So here are cool things for you to consider doing. And um, just imagine how cool it will be to see the brightest star in the sky wink out wherever you are. Now, in addition to this, we have other news coming to us, in this case from Macquarie University down in Sydney, Australia. And this news is news that the disk we live in is not flat. In fact, it now appears that our own Milky Way galaxy, this image is distorted and is actually a painting, it's now believed that our own Milky Way galaxy, which is a barred spiral galaxy, may have a warp. What this means is that gravitational interactions with other objects and the merger of other objects into our own Milky Way have twisted up the disk of the Milky Way, making it appear warped. Now, this particular warp, as I said, this is a painting, this is exaggerated. But this particular warp was actually mapped out in a way that is near and dear to my observational astronomy heart. This was done with Cepheid variable stars. These are stars that slowly change in size and brightness over days to tens of days. And they do this in a way that is directly correlated to how much light they give off. The more luminous the star, the more slowly they pulse in and out. The smaller the star, the more rapidly it pulses in and out. And thus, by measuring how long it takes a given Cepheid variable star to change in brightness, we're able to know how much light it's actually giving off. And if we know that, and we measure how bright it appears, we can calculate the distance to the star. This is something that human beings just do naturally. If you step out to the sidewalk and you're getting ready to the cross the street and you do as you should always do and look both ways, even on a one-way street because some people are stupid, um, when you step out, if you see that single headlight of a motorcycle coming towards you, you can gauge its distance, even if it's silent and electric, based just on how bright that light appears. If it's extraordinarily bright, you know it's nearby, and if you step into the road, something bad might happen. But if it's quite faint, it's probably off in the distance, and you can safely cross the road. Now, with Cepheids, we do the mathematical version of that to get as precise, precise as all of our various theoretical and measurement errors allow into knowing the distance to these objects. The team that put together this map measured 1,339 pulsating Cepheid variable stars. This gave them the distance to all of these stars. And by assuming that Cepheids are evenly distributed throughout the disk of the galaxy, they were able to figure out that the population of stars, and thus that disk of our galaxy, is warped. Now the thing is, it could be that these Cepheids are all drawn from a special population that has a warp, and that there's another bulk of stars that don't have a warp. But from being inside the galaxy, we just can't know. This is a pretty cool piece of research. It is the kind of thing that anyone with enough patience and the ability to observe stars all over the sky has the ability to do. So um, kudos folks at Macquarie, you did good. Um, so thank you so much. Um, that is the science I have for today. Now we had a request yesterday to consider um, talking about what is it that PanStars is up to with their latest data release and what is being known. What we've decided to do is we're going to start doing extended episodes on Wednesdays, bringing you a deep dive into a different topic each week. Um, so prepare for tomorrow being a roundup of the news followed by a roundup of pan stars. Now there are a variety of spacecraft launches going on today and you can find out all about these from our own uh, Annie Wilson. This is binary ablaze in the chat. 
So tune in and see her do her thing later today. And this is your reminder. I will stick around and answer your questions right after this show is over. So start typing them in and at me as CosmoQuest X. This is something that you can only do if you're watching live on Twitch. But we know not everyone can always be here live. This is why we archive every show over on YouTube. Thank you for the Vitz Keeper of Maps. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, if you miss an episode later in the day, we will have everything posted over on YouTube. And can you do us a favor and subscribe to us on YouTube? It's totally free. All it takes is a click. This will really help us increase the probability that will come up in various people's search results. Thank you, Disillusioned, for the subscription. Thank you so much. Um, and as always, this is part of CosmoQuest. The Daily Space is a production of CosmoQuest, which is created out of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are supported by you. We are sustained through your subscriptions and every bit really helps. If you want to give more and get more, we have our own Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Over there, you can find out more about what's going on behind the scenes, get regular updates, and we have all sorts of cool rewards to people at various donation levels. So subscribe here, get the emotes, and we do have more emotes coming. And subscribe over there and get all sorts of cool things to support you in learning science and support us in creating the content. Thank you so much, Veronica Cure. Thank you. So now I am going to rearrange my screen a bit and find where on the screen the questions are hiding. There they are. Okay, so I have so many things re ringing today. Um, I will return that call in a few minutes. Um, sorry, was distracted by phone ringing. Um, so Astra B is asking, is it possible that at least that there is at least as much more universe beyond the CMB than we can detect. In fact, we know there has to be. So this is one of those really weird things to try and understand. The cosmic microwave background isn't the edge of the universe. It's simply the edge of what we're able to see. The, the cosmic microwave background was produced everywhere in the universe simultaneously. So if we were able to go and travel to a place that is... 13.8 point yada 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 light years away from that point in the universe where we are or where our light was emitted at that point we've moved since then um those observers in that far off place would see the cosmic microwave background that was produced in the point where our point in space was located back in the past so essentially, the, the way to think of it is, imagine our universe as a giant, um, I need a cube. I don't, I have a cube. Okay. Thank you, New Hope 999999. I think I got enough nines um, for the follow. Okay, so imagine you have a cube. Now, this is a cube that we can look into for which I'm grateful. This represents the, the, a segment of the universe, not the whole universe, but I just needed a section of it. The cosmic microwave background was, was emitted by every single point in the universe, but any given observer can only see one small, do I have an actual sphere? Yes, can only see one small sphere. So someone over here, can see that sphere. Someone, I'm going to do this wrong. This shows up in mirror image on my screen and I'm still learning how to do that. So someone over there is going to see that sphere. So different observers in different places see a different volume of our total universe. Now we know that the total universe is greater than what we're able to see because space has light that stays parallel 
And the only way that light can stay parallel is if we're actually on the surface of not a cube, but a donut shape. Here I'm going to use a, yes, I have a hair scrunchie. Yes, I know this is a relic from the 80s. Pretend it's a donut. I need to get a giant plastic donut at some point. So with a donut shape, two parallel lines can go all the way around the top and always stay parallel. They can go all the way around through the inside and always stay parallel. They can cut at a weird angle across the donut and always stay parallel. And, and this is the shape of our universe. And, and since the light can go all the way around, it can come back. And when we look out at that cosmic microwave background, we never see the light coming back. We never essentially look at the back of our own head. And this means that the light hasn't had time to travel that far, even along the shortest dist distance around that donut. Various cosmologists have figured out different ways of estimating this. And um, the, the study that is stuck most in my head um, said that our universe has to be what we can see what we can see, the observable part of our universe, has to be no more than 4% of the total universe. It might be four one millionths of the total universe. Heck, the universe could be infinite. We don't know. So our observable universe, there's a whole lot of universe at distances far greater than that distance where the cosmic microwave background photons came from. It just happens to be that light has only had time to reach us from that distance. Um, light takes time. This causes all sorts of weird, cool things to happen. Um, I have some good blog posts on this over on Star Strider. Hit me up on Discord. Um, just at me on the general channel and I'll drop you a link. Um, so let me see what other questions we have. Um, hi, Mike Cassidy. Um, I want, I just want a donut, Paranor. I want a Dunkin' Donuts donut. I live in the land where there's neither Dunkin' Donuts nor Krispy Kreme. Um, uh, if only we had a local donut shop. I want donuts. Um, I have not had any lunch yet. This may be part of the problem. Um, so Hanny is, is saying, I do not understand why scientists are confused by the anthropic principle. Wouldn't we have to exist somewhere? Wouldn't we have to exist somewhere for people to be allowed to live? I need you to explain your question more. Um, that may be a deeper conversation. So try writing it out longer. And if I can't answer it here... Um, the one, the best book to read is Cosmic Landscapes by Larry Suskind. This is the kind of question that may actually just require reading an entire book. Um, I really want donuts now. Yes, Fessens, Witchin, it's a tasty universe out there. Um, you has pizza, I do not has pizza. I am going to have a frozen burrito that has been microwaved after this episode is over. Um... So the cosmic microwave background does fill up the universe. And everywhere you go, you're seeing photons from a different part of the first days of the universe. Um, it's, it's like the, the way I often think of it is when you go underwater, um, deep, deep underwater where the sunlight doesn't penetrate and turn on a headlamp, a submarine lamp, whatever light source it is, it lights up an area of water around you but that light can only go so far and everything beyond that is unknown for us there's no headlamp illuminating it but there is a visible part to our universe and just like as you move in the water your headlamp moves with you and you see a different volume of the sea as you move through our universe you see a different visible universe um let's see anything else wow all the things are coming in all the things um okay are there any other questions um 
Okay, Bill Nash has a planetary science question. Uh, can we get a shout out for Bill Nash, please? He is another science education streamer here on Twitch who sadly did not get to go do astrophotography due to the cold and snow. And I'm grateful he is well and healthy and did not freeze. But I feel sad that we don't have his photos. Okay, so Bill Nash is saying, uh, if we manage to somehow start generating breathable atmosphere on Mars, how fast will it lose it? Is it moot point to even try? Um, it gets to keep it for a length of time that will be useful for several generations, but will go away. And, and it kind of seems like we'd be better off creating giant domes and living within the domes. Um, the, the other issue that you run into is because it doesn't, it, it, I mean, how do you get that much air there? You have to bombard it with, with icy objects, steal a moon from Saturn, Jupiter, grab some Kuiper belt objects. The amount of energy necessary to make an entire atmosphere on Mars, because you have to bring the stuff back. Um, it's easier to just build a domed city. I, I am a fan of a domed city. Um, or better yet, take a crater and just roof it over. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, now, now I want to live in a domed city. Um, um, oh, all the food thoughts. Okay. Um, Logan's Run, yes, that is true. But Logan's Run didn't have nearly the windows that I'm hoping for. Um, so Bill Nash has a follow-up question. If we mastered the art of farming the Kuiper belt and Oort cloud for mass and managed to increase Mars mass to a viable point, is there a ripple effect in solar system orbital stability? I think everything will still be um, stable. It's just the small wanders of each orbit would vary. Um, these kinds of variations have always happened. Things get hit, collisions occur. Heck, our own planet at one point before we had the moon was smaller and got hit by something the size of Mars. Um, solar systems are constantly changing. Orbits themselves, however, don't when when one object such as the sun is so much more massive than a planet the stability of the orbit doesn't vary it's just the wanderance of the orbit they're all slightly elliptical so um yeah we could totally bloat up mars but i don't think there's enough mass in all those objects to do that the total mass of of the asteroid belt isn't enough to build a world so we might have to go mine other solar systems, and that probably isn't a good idea. Um, so Lord High Fixer is asking, Mars orbit would change with its change in overall mass. Um, not so much. So, so the way orbits work is you have two different things that you worry about. The primary thing that you worry about is you have your giant central solar mass. So now my frog-like thing is the sun. You then have all your planets going around. So here I have a turtle that's a planet. And when I'm calculating the orbit of this planet around this sun, I can use it by looking at what is the ratio in math between these two objects. If this mass is much, much smaller than this mass, which is true with suns and planets, I can pretty much ignore this mass in calculating the orbit of this planet around this star. Now the thing is, if instead I'm looking at a binary system, so two objects that are roughly the same mass, then in calculating the orbit I need to take into consideration both masses. Now that's the primary orbit, so if I want to get a good average understanding of Mars orbital period around the sun, its average distance from the sun, I'm good to go with this mass, without this mass, sorry, this mass, as long as it stays much smaller than the sun, I don't need to know it. I'm good to go with the distance between these two objects and this mass. Now the thing is, this planet isn't alone. There are other planets out there, and so 
the I'm running out of fingers. Um, so if I have planet dog and planet turtle, as planet dog passes near planet turtle, its mass is going to slightly pull on planet turtle and vice versa. And these small perturbations are small. They're not going to yank anything out of orbit. They're not going to change the stability of the orbit around the sun, but they are going to perturb the orbits. And um, so if you change the mass of Mars, that's going to change the per perturbations that we see on the other asteroids, on Jupiter, on Earth, on everything else. Perturbations is a good word. And I do have turtles everywhere. Um, I Every time I go to a new country, I get a new turtle. So, um, and then I sometimes get them at science fiction shows. So I have turtles all over the place because it's turtles all the way down. Um, yeah, now you know more about me than you knew before. Um, yes, it is turtles all the way down and all the way up. I do need an Ori. Um, I do. I had one. It was made out of Legos. And when I left SIUE, they reclaimed my Ori. Um, these things happen when you switch institutions. Um, so Fenson Winchen is asking, would it not be possible to save Mars from solar wind by using a satellite in the right place? No, sadly, no. Um, the, 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 you're just not going to be able to get there from here. Uh, you can partially do it. You can partially help, but it's just not enough. And the other big thing is you have, um, just not enough gravity. So, here on Earth, we lose helium. An oxygen molecule will be muddling along through the atmosphere, hit a hydrogen atom, transfer momentum, and suddenly that hydrogen is going at escape velocity. The same thing can happen to helium. Every time you have a helium balloon and release helium into the atmosphere, that helium is going to leave the Earth. If we're not careful, Earth will actually run out of helium. Um, I've said this before, use of balloons for joy and happiness is actually a really bad use of resources. We need helium for a lot of scientific purposes and it's non-renewable because it leaves the earth. Um, yeah, you can learn all sorts of random things. Um, Yeah, so, so the delta in Mars mass due to adding an atmosphere is negligible. But someone had actually mentioned, um, yeah, they totally took my Legos. I had, I had a, we had them for doing classroom exercises, and then I specifically ordered Legos for building an orrery, and they confiscated all of my Legos when I left the institution. Um, Yes, sorry. I'm still apparently bitter about losing all of my Legos. Um, so, so someone had mentioned DPI-209, the idea of actually increasing the mass of Mars so that it wouldn't lose its atmosphere. Um, that would start to cause perturbations. Um, so Bill Nash, um, we could, but the rate at which we would be producing it would be awful small. Um, so yes, but, but I think we're better off just not using balloons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey there, C death. Um, MRIs are loud. That is true. That is very true. Um, Yeah, that is pretty much what happened. Um, yeah, they confiscated everything that was a non-disposable item. <sighs> so, um, what makes them loud? I should know this. I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. I think it may be a safety thing, like the noise that buses make when backing up um because they they are big magnets moving around but I don't know why they couldn't create quiet big magnets and if you've ever had to have an MRI the pitch changes 
um, depending on what they're doing. Um, but do they have to make noise? I know they have magnets, but I don't think they have to make noise. I think it's a choice for them to make noise. Um, that's cool, Bill Nash. Um, and you do not ever want an MRI. That is true. It would be removed in ways that might really hurt. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, DPI. That is awesome. Um, okay, so it's the rapid pulses of electricity. So this is like frost heaves. Um, or so you know how when you turn on the oven you can and if you leave a pan inside of it you can hear the pan chasing changing shape as the metal expands with the heat in this case it would be a similar kind of process where the pulsing of the electricity because it's a lot of electromagnet electromagnetism um, is causing things to deform in response to all of that that's something that hadn't yeah it's it's essentially dry heaves um, so yeah Kboard has a good explanation, it looks like. Yep, coil, coil Barrett has it exactly right. When the current is switched on, the force of the coil goes from zero to huge in just milliseconds, causing the coil to expand, which makes a loud click. When the MRI is making an image, the current is switched on and off rapidly. The result is a rapid fire clicking noise, which is amplified by the enclosed space in which the patient lies. This is, I wonder if this is why open MRIs are so much quieter. Um, cool. Very cool. That is cool, Bill Nash. Um, I, for one, wait for the day when uh, RFID technology is sufficiently advanced that it makes sense to get RFID chips implanted. I know there's a few people who've already done that. Um, yeah. Okay, we are going far afield of astronomy. Um, can anyone ask any additional questions? So there we go. Extra dimensional space time is saying, well, I have a question. Do you think that black holes can have a multi singularity other than a single sing single singularity as in rotating black holes, which are 90% of the black holes? Um, so a ring of singularities, I the probability of having that is pretty much zero. But um, you do actually have binary black hole systems, which are two rotating black holes, two rotating singularities going around each other. So that is completely normal. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lord High Fixer, it all depends on what you do. Um, I'm pretty much someone who lives out loud and thus keeps myself out of trouble. Um, so you can already figure out where I am from various things. So I'm okay with it. Um, um, can you press the release from a few inches as well? That would be cool. Oh, refs, Matt, you did miss it. I can pull up this stuff, though. Thank you so much for the links on that, by the way. Um, so, so what I was saying for those of you who came in late was uh, there's going to be an occultation of the bright star Cirrus by the asteroid uh, Jürgenstock. This is 4388 Jürgenstock. And uh, this is where you need to be to see it, um, to zoom in to the landy bit of that image. Here's where you need to be on land to see this. This will occur on February 19th at 519 Universal Time. Um, so yeah, um, cool things occur. Um, and I just totally failed to click the correct button to bring the chat back. Let's get the chat back. Uh, still not the correct button. There's the correct button. Okay. Um, usually occultations are at most a few minutes. Um, I don't know precisely because you have to know the orbital differences and stuff like that. 
Um, so this one's a few seconds. I guess I'm used to thinking about further out objects and stuff. Um, hey, Phoenix. Um, okay. Let's see what other questions do we hear? Skylius is along the path. Yes. Um, yes, Hanny, I agree. He probably is great with um, small screws. So uh, thanks, Susie, for posting the question again. Do you think white holes can exist? No. Um, so the, the issue with both wormholes and white holes is while they exist theoretically, while they exist mathematically, both of them cease to exist the second that any mass, or in this case energy, because energy and mass are the same thing, passes inside their event horizon. This means that any wormholes or white holes that have ever existed have gone away because the cosmic microwave background light, which we talked about earlier in this episode, the cosmic microwave background light permeates all of space and everything but the first 400,000 second or for first 400,000 years of the universe and before that everything permeated permeated the universe so we can't have white holes or wormholes due to the cosmic microwave background um so raven is saying and if you could at me it will make things so much easier um the raven lillian is saying do you know if anyone is planning to live live stream from a telescope or something on the occultation i don't know i need to find out um let me see what i can find out so extra dimensional space it looks like you're asking if you can tell me what i already think about what happens to time in black holes um i already know what i think i think you're asking what you meant to ask was if you can give me a brief about what you think about what happens to time um i i would recommend that that instead of sending it to me um if you're working on research on this peer-reviewed journals um while i am qualified to peer review some research on black holes um i'm a phd astrophysicist i did my dissertation on um the evolution of galaxy clusters is a function of mass and time. Um, I'm not really in a good position to get into the nitty gritty of a lot of relativity. Um, so peer review is your best friend for things like this. Um, okay, so we are more than out of time. You got an extra long episode today because I started late due to my own personal failing to note that pressing the streaming button does not always cause you to stream. So thank you all for your patience. Thank you for being here. As always, this is part of CosmoQuest. CosmoQuest X is your place to learn and do science. We are still in the process of recovering from switching institutions, uh, having our grant yanked and restarting thanks to your donations. We are here because of people like you. Thank you so much for all that you do to support us across the months and years. Um, we are going to keep being here tomorrow and many tomorrows to come. Thanks to your subscriptions, your bits, your support on Patreon, your donations. Thank you. And um, later today, our own binary ablaze, Annie Wilson, will be back two different times. So follow so you will get the notifications. And she is going to be bringing you live coverage of those rockets as they launch. So... Thank you, and I will be back tomorrow and most Mondays through Fridays um, to bring you the daily space, your daily dose of what is new in space and astronomy. Uh, you can find us at 1 p.m. Eastern. That is 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. London time. I'm going to roll the credits, and while I do that, I am going to madly hunt for somebody to raid. Feel free to give me raiding suggestions. All raiding suggestions are appreciated. Not all will always be used, but they will all be appreciated. So, um, this has been today's episode. 
wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, afternoon. And if the weather allows, go outside and look up. Bye-bye.